Isaiah prophesies to the people of God, Judah, while they're in exile and tells them that there is hope, that there is a deliverance that's going to take place. In this lesson entitled, God Offers Deliverance, we're going to see what that is, what it looks like, and who did God tell for them to look back to as a sure sign? There are notes for this lesson. I'll leave a link in the description below and in the comment section. Click that link, get your notes, your Sunday school books, and your Bibles. For this lesson is already late. Hurry. Let's go. Teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence. Join L. Rodney Jones with our Sunday school lesson. Building and equipping the children of God. Grab your Bibles and grab your notes. Get your lessons and get ready. Now let's go. Welcome, 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 welcome to Sunday School. I am your teacher, Pastor Dr. Rodney Jones. I'm the pastor of the New Nation Anointed Ministries. Church of God in Christ, we're located 1700 West 87th Street in the city of Chicago. Our zip code is 60620. I would like to welcome you. Those of you who this is your first time, please leave me a comment in the section below so that I can welcome you. There's my email if you want to drop me a personal question, a personal prayer request, or whatever the case may be. I need you to click that like, that thumbs up, that set, uh, subscribe, and then that bell notification so YouTube will notify you. Bink! He just uploaded another lesson. We got a good one here on today. It's a very interesting lesson, and we're dealing with God offers deliverance. We're in the book of Isaiah, the 51st chapter, verses 1 through 8. Today's date is June the 26th, uh, 2022. And uh, this is the international, the international lesson. We're behind just a few days, but God is an awesome God. Very interesting in context. And that's how we're going to be teaching this lesson per the context. That's how I like to do things, the context with this lesson. Make sure, if you can and will, to get your notes. The aim for this lesson is by the end of this lesson, we will examine Isaiah's example of God's rich uh, faithfulness in Israel's spiritual history. And then number two, we're going to trust God, even when others speak despairingly about our faith. And share the goodness and deliverance of God with others. I like that first one, that we're to examine Isaiah's example of God's rich faithfulness in Israel's spiritual history. And that's dealing with when the Lord told them to look at Abraham and Sarah, because when he called him, he was one. Let's get right into our lesson let's see what we got all right we're gonna move this out the way gonna put that there gonna hit that button which does nothing then we're gonna go right to <laughs> the reading of the scriptures hearken now right off the bat the first thing i want you to focus on is that word right there hearken to me and he's speaking to a specific individual. You're the ones I want to hearken. Who are the ones that he wants to hearken? He's going to give it to us. Number one, those that follow after righteousness. And number two, those that seek, those that seek the Lord. He says, I want you to hearken. Number two, he says to do something that's very similar to hearken, but he says to look. Now, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, look unto me, but he points them unto the rock, which he are hewn from. Now, on a normal case, the rock, yes, would be Jesus or it would be God. It would be whatever the case may be. 
Here he doesn't say that the rock is him. And I'm going to show you that who he meant when he says, look unto the rock, uh, which ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit, which ye are digged. So the Lord speaks through Isaiah to his people concerning a future event. He calls for the people to hearken or listen with the intent of obeying what's being said. He calls for them to look unto a certain place and he explains this rock or this pit that they come from. The word throughout the lesson, there are certain words that appear frequently. And those of you that study, especially that does an in-depth study, I always say, always find words that's repeated by the writer, by the author. It's repeated. And once it's repeated, that means it is an important word. It's a key word. Here, the word righteousness is repeated some five times. The word salvation is repeated some three times. And even the word hearken is repeated some three times, although one of those times is slightly different than the other three. So when he says he will comfort Zion uh, and he says he will comfort their wastes, uh, it appears that this really is the thing. So basically everything else that we're going to be reading about has to do with that particular item, that particular focus that particular thing that's in the mind. So the first thing he says is to hearken, hearken, which means to give ear, to hear intelligently with implication of obedience. He says, follow after, hearken to me, ye that follow after. To follow after something is to pursue, but it is also to attend closely upon it. You're not just behind it, but you're following behind it closely with a purpose. There is a purpose for you following after this righteousness. Now the word righteousness is used in here a lot of times. However, sometimes it's kind of difficult to understand uh, the usage of the writer. And so what I had to do was continue to read this and apply it according to how I study to see how this word is used. Always remember, the best way to find out the meaning of a word is to place it in the context and use the word per the context. Mm -hmm. So he says his righteousness, those that follow after righteousness, which means just or justice. Righteousness is a right relation to an ethical or a legal standard. It is really in the right standards with God, but that may not be what he's referring to, or it may be what he's referring to at this point. However, the way it's placed as if he's saying his justice or what he is getting ready to do. Now, I understand also that those that are following after his righteousness are following after his ways. And so that word righteous here would be justice or a right relation or having a right standard with God himself. He says also those that seek to seek, which means to search out by any method, specifically in worship and prayer, as it relates to this lesson, it also means to strive after. You who seek, who uh, strive after the Lord, remember the Lord is all capital. Let me show you this, because a lot of times we overlook and we bypass that word, that word Lord. Let me pull this up, up, go back, go back, because I said go back, yeah, because I want to change the color. Yeah, that word right here, Lord, notice is how it's spelled, is all cap right there. So sometimes you'll find the Lord, the word Lord, all cap, and sometimes you'll find it like that. The two of them spelling like that means something different. So you that follow the Lord, the word Lord here means the self-existing. He simply exists simply because he exists. So the Bible says in Psalms 94 and 15 that the upright in heart shall follow after righteousness. So the prophet speaks only to a specific group. He's talking about those that follow or pursue after righteousness and those that seek the Lord. And this may be a double way of even saying the same thing. And this may be called what we call Hebrew parallelism. That's to take two things side by side, uh, said in two different ways, but it really means the same thing. I could have been dead sleeping in my grave, blind and could not see. That's, that's, that's basically saying the same thing. Uh, Proverbs 21, 21 says, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life. 
uh, righteousness and honor. He says, now look unto the rock which ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit which ye are digged. The word look here means to consider, to regard. Yes, as a matter of fact, I want to consider in here so much until I got it in here twice. Mm. And I'm not a Hebrew. So it means to look, to consider. He says, consider the rock. Look at the rock. Gaze at this rock. Take in consideration or even regard. Regard this rock. We're having a light shortage here. Regard this rock that you were hewn out. The word hewn means to be cut or carved, to dig or even to divide. They were told to look, consider the rock from whence they came. Check your stock. Check the quarry or the quarry that you were mined out of or from. Look at the pit that you were dug out. And he's talking something in specific. And we'll tell you what that is so as we get to that next verse. Now watch it. He goes from saying uh, rock and pit to saying who that rock and the pit is. Yes, because the rock he's referring to is Abraham. He says, look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah that bore you. Now, when she bore them right there, that would be part two of the first verse. He says, the hole of the pit whence ye are digged out. It's interesting how he uses this language. Remember, he's not using our language. And remember, the king is translating it per the king's language some four to five hundred years ago. Look unto the, uh, Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah that bore you. For I called him. When I called him, I called him alone. And when I called him, he was alone. Now understand this calling. We're going to talk about that. Not only did he say I called him, but I blessed him and I increased him. Who did this? God did it. So the same God that's telling them, to look unto him or to be obedient or the same God that's saying to them that he's going to deliver them now tells them to check their history, check your roots, check your foundation, check your standard, check where you came from. And I'm going to show you by example that the reason you came through him is because I blessed him. So the same God that has blessed your stock, your father, your foundation, your pillar, uh, uh, is the same one who said he's going to deliver you. So he says, I have the power and I am faithful and truthful and you can depend on me. So he says, I called, which means to summon or to invite. I called him and then I blessed him or I honored and I favored him. And then I increased him, which means to become numerous or great. Now watch this. God called Abraham he says, from the other side of the flood and blessed him. That's Joshua 24 and 3. He called him from his country and led him through. Now he says, I called him from the other side and I led him through in Joshua. But he called him per uh, Genesis 12 verses 1. Although Genesis 12 and 1 is not the actual call because it said God had said, which is past tense, which had to have taken place prior to the 12th chapter. The Lord promised Abraham that he would, bl would bless him in Genesis 12 and 3. He promised Abraham that he would multiply his seed in Genesis 26 and 4. And Sarah at that time was barren and could not have children. That's Genesis 11 and 30. And God blessed and opened up her womb and she conceived Genesis 21. And Abraham would be a father of many nations according to the scriptures in Genesis 17 chapter, the fifth verse. And when God called him, he pulled him away from the other side, Joshua 24 and 3. And God gave him Isaac, Joshua 24 and 3 also. In other words, God kept his word. So he called Abraham and Sarah and he made an entire nation from and through them. This is the same God that says that I'm getting ready to comfort you. And I want you to support and to believe me and then just check and look at the rock, look at the foundation, look where you came from and recognize that I'm the one who called your daddy when he was alone, a nobody. And he and his family was worshiping idol gods because it is said that Abraham's father was an idol god maker 
and the worshiper, but God pulled him from there, blessed him, and gave him uh, the children of Israel through many nations. So he said, I increase him. Verses number 20 or verses number three, he says, for the Lord, for the Lord shall. There it is right there. Now, for the Lord shall. Now, that's a declarative statement. Yeah, God is going to do it and he's going to make sure. What is he going to do? He's going to comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord and joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Who's going to do it? God right there. God. God is going to do this himself. There it is right there. He said that he himself is going to do it. So the Lord says for them to look unto Abraham as an example of where they came from. God called and separated Abraham alone and then blessed Abraham with all of those children. Hmm. He changed Abraham's name as well. He changed his name from Abram to Abraham and you will find that in Genesis, the 17th chapter and verses five, he promised here to even comfort Zion, which is called Judah, which is the city of David. It's the mountain and it's the uh, dwellers therein. And Zion is another name for the church. Look at what he said. There will be heard in that place joy and gladness and there will be thanksgiving. So the Lord himself is going to do this comforting Zion. Now, I know. My screen looks slightly different. There was a, uh, a situation that just taken place. And however, we're going to move forward. So point number eight is he promises here to comfort Zion. And the Lord promises that he's going to comfort Zion himself. Not only will he comfort Zion, but he was also going to comfort the people that lives in Zion. And there are times when the word Zion is talking about the place. The city of David. Sometimes the word Zion means the church. Sometimes the word Zion means the people. Sometimes the word Zion means all of which because of the location. There will be heard in the place joy and gladness. There will be thanksgiving. The people will be able to celebrate the fruit of the land once again. The Bible says that the promised land was a land that was flowing with milk and honey. And you can find that in uh, Exodus, I believe it is, yes, 33 and 3. And number two was they were told to let the land rest in Leviticus 25 and 4. And they was told that if they didn't let the land rest, that the Lord would send them an exile so that he can cause the land to rest. And they did not let the land rest. And God did send them into the Babylonian captivity, which is one of the main reasons why they are in Babylon at that moment. You find that in Leviticus 26 and 34. He says, I'll send you away. To make sure that the land rests because God was sincere about its promise. So Zion is called this because it is the city of David. Because David took this city, the city of Zion, and he used it as his homeland. That second Samuel, the fifth chapter, verses seven. He says, for the Lord shall comfort Zion. The word comfort means to console or to have compassion. And as I said before, Zion is the city of David or the city of of Jerusalem. He says he will comfort all her waste places. The word waste places means the desolations, a decayed place or the place of ruins because throughout the land, not only were ruins throughout the land, but the land itself was ruined. And God says, I'm going to comfort you and I'm going to comfort your desolate places, your places that have been lied in, in decayed or uh, in, in ruins because when the Babylonians came in, they destroyed the city. They burnt up the city and they took a lot of stuff and people. He says he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord, which is a beautiful thing for God to say that he's going to make your wasteland like my garden. He says will make, which means to bring, to do, to ordain or even to establish. And he uses the word wilderness to mean a desert or an open field or something that has been uninhabited. 
He was going to take the uninhabited land, the land that was messed up, tore up, uncultivated. Nobody possibly was there. He would take even that land and make it appear or make it look like the Garden of Eden. One of the most beautiful places that could possibly be imaginable to man would be this Garden of Eden, where the original man, Adam and his wife Eve, were located in Eden, the Garden of God. In this land, he says, and when he finishes, there's going to be joy, gladness, is going to be uh, found therein, thanksgiving, and the voice of melody. Joy means cheerfulness. It means gladness. There's going to be rejoicing. And some of these words are closely related because out of joy, you get cheerfulness, gladness, and rejoicing. Out of the word gladness, you get joyfulness, joy, exceeding gladness, and also rejoicing. He says all of this uh, joy and gladness shall be found. The word found means to come forth to even to appear, to exist, or even to occur. It's going to exist. It's going to occur in the land. And lastly, he says, or before the last one, he says there's going to be thanksgiving. The word thanksgiving means the extension of the hands. It means adoration. It's thanks, thanksgiving, or a thank offering. The people will begin to give God a thank offering. They will be extending their hands to him as thanksgiving, and offering up a lip of sacrifice of praise. He makes what appears to be a fourfold blessing of joy. Joy will be in the land. Gladness shall be found in the land. Thanksgiving will be in the land. And the voice of melody shall be heard throughout the land. The people will be comforted. There will be rejoicing. There will be dancing. There will be laughter. There will be singing. There will be praises and everything else that will take place in the land. Then he says, hearken unto me. This is the second time that he uses the word hearken. Remember we said it before, God wants his people to listen to him. Listen, listen, and obey him. All in one word. Now look, he's talking to him. He says, listen unto me, or hearken unto me, my people, because God owns the people. Yeah, the people are owned by God. No man owns another man. Yes, not even in slavery. Not only does he says hearken, but he says something that's slightly the same, but sometimes can stand on his own. Not only do I want you to hearken, but I want you to give ear. O oh, my nation, for a law shall proceed from me. God is the one that's doing all of this, me. And I will make my judgment to rest for the light of the people. Now, here is where it includes the Gentiles. Yes, that's where the Gentiles are going to be getting in uh, in this comfort zone. Yes, this is the second time of the three times of the word Lord is saying the word hearken, I should say. The usage of the word hearken here means to pay close attention to what's said. He's about to give them some news worth listening to, but it uh, it needs their close attention so they are to pull their ear closer. So to hearken means to prick up the ears. It's different than the word hearken in verse 4, verse 1. Here it means pay attention and cause to hear. Give ear means to broaden out the ear with the hand, that is to listen. So both which says Pay close attention, strict attention to what I'm about to say. He's calling out unto his people again. He calls them my people. He calls them my nation because he's the one that called them out of Egypt. He called them out of bondage. He redeemed them. He purchased them. He bought them. He removed them. And he says Israel is his servant. They belong to him. Quiet as is kept. That when the Lord says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, seek my faith. He says, I will hear from heaven. I will heal their land. That specific uh, Second Chronicles 7 and 14 is to the children of Israel. That's who that was written for and to. Because Solomon, when he prayed, he put four petitions before God. He says, God, if your people are in trouble, if they get in trouble by you, if you send them away, if they turn to your temple and pray, will you hear? 
God says, if they turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear. And last he said, I will heal their land because nobody else on earth has land. The only one that owns land is the people who was given land by God himself. We can use that, uh, the principle of it, which means if we obey God, then some things will take place. But every time disaster and stuff happen, that passage of scripture always shows up. That's not really about us. But I'm going to keep it moving uh, uh, in this direction. So he says, hearken and hear. I will make my judgment to rest, to rest for a light of the people. Now, this is where it looks like it's uh, inclusive or including the Gentiles. He says, I'll make my judgment, which means the laws or statutes. Uh, a laws or statutes is what he's referring to here. He says, I'm going to make it rest which means to act in an instinct, to stir up, to establish firmly. The first usage of the word nation is Israel. Let me see if I can find that. He says, hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. Now watch this, O my nation, right here. For a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. Now watch this. I think we will get to the next verse and you will see what I'm referencing soon as we get to this. So he says, uh, so the first usage of the word nation is the, is the Gentiles. The original gospel message will ultimately reach the Gentiles. It started with the Jews, but he says his law, he will send his law out. His law is going to proceed from him. And his law, and he will make his judgments to rest, to act in an instant or to stir up, to establish firmly. His judgments is going to rest for a light of the people. Remember, the Gentiles were living in darkness and the gospel was the gospel of light of truth. Matter of fact, that would be Jesus was the light of for the Gentiles. And you'll find that in Luke's gospel verse chapter two, verses two. This is where we believe this part includes the Gentiles as well. We might come back to that. We'll see. I'm having a lot of technical issues here with lights, uh, computers, and everything is going bad. I had to stop the broadcast and all of that because of some issues that's going on. But we're moving forward. My righteousness is near. My, my. Now watch what he says. My righteousness my salvation, mine arms uh -huh, shall wait upon me and mine arms. Now, what I saw is two things. And let's see if you can see this. I saw these two things. He used the word my. But when he got to the arms uh, and judgment, he used the word mine as if to say his particular body, although we know he does not have a body. I'll explain that to you what I mean in just a minute. Let me see if I can pull this out. So everything in this verse is personally collect, con connected to the Lord himself. He uses a personal touch. My righteousness is near. My salvation is going forth. My arms shall judge the people. The aisles shall wait upon me. And on mine arm shall they trust. And that word isles really includes the outer nations, the outer, uh, the islands, the regions, the countries, and the Gentiles. The fact that his righteousness is near means that it is available. And the Lord is going to cause all of the people to take place. He will play an active part in all of this. He says, my, my righteousness is near. And remember, the word righteousness is used in many ways, and it depends on how the author uses it, especially in the lesson. The righteousness here could be justice, his truth, his faithfulness, his mercy, or even his deliverance, because this whole thing is about him comforting uh, Israel or Judah, comforting the land, and then also uh, bringing another people to himself because what he does is God's going to shine a light on the other aisles of the other nations. He says, my righteousness is near, which is close. It's at hand. It's ready. The assignment or the thing that I'm going to do, he says, is near. 
my justice is near, my truth is near, and my faithfulness is near. And a lot of times the word near means it's present. It's right there. It's right before you. So based on this thing, they will be delivered out of exile. That being the case, the word righteous could mean, not righteousness, could mean deliverance. My deliverance is close. It is coming near and it is about to take place. This is the future hope of deliverance for his people because this deliverance extends throughout the whole entire world. Everybody that chooses to receive his word is going to be delivered. He says, my salvation is gone forth and mine arms shall judge the people. Salvation here again means liberty, his safety or deliverance or even the rescue. My deliverance, remember, in order for him to bring those out of exile and bring us out of sin, he's got to deliver us. And that's the word salvation. He says, my salvation has gone forth and mine arms. The word arms means force. It means might. It means strength. And the word arms here implies the outstretched hand of God. In other words, God is showing that he's taking a personal entrance in interest in this particular deliverance. He's going to do it by his arm, by his strength, by his power, by his might. It's going to be his will, and he's going to have a hands-on connection to making sure that this takes place. He says, and mine arms shall judge the people. The word judge could mean pronounce sentence, to vindicate or even punish. It means to govern the people, to execute or even to deliver, because the word judge also means to deliver. So once again, notice the personal presence of God, my, 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 my salvation. He's already executed his promise and it's going to take place. And then he says, the isles shall wait upon me and on my arm shall they trust. That word isles is coast. That word isles means the shore. It means a region or even a country. This would include other nations other than the Jews, this would extend out to all nations, to the Gentile nation. He said that they're going to wait, which means to expect, to look for, to tarry for, to hope, or to wait or look eagerly for. They're going to be waiting in expectation of him. He mentions a word, his word, the word again, my arm shall they trust. My arm means my help. It means my might, my power, my shoulder, or my strength. They're going to trust in my strength. They're going to trust in my help, in my power. And the word trust here really means to be patient and to hope and also to stay. They're going to be able to stay because they are patient and they're trusting in my arm is what he says. Let's look at verses number six. Verse number six, he says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth. He's always telling them to do something. Lift up and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation, there it is again, my salvation shall be forever my righteousness he keeps throwing it up shall not be abolished it's not going to be so this is proof that the heavens and the earth is not going to last forever but he says here that is not going to always be hmm. there will be a new earth and a new heaven per revelation 21 and the earth, the Bible says, shall melt away with fervent heat, 2 Peter 3 and 10. This earth is corrupt due to man and his sin. And the instructions were to look at and observe the heavens and the earth below. The purpose for this observation is twofold. The heavens and the earth are going to vanish as old. And they that dwell in the land is going to also vanish. But his salvation shall never vanish or be abolished, I should say. And righteousness will not be abolished as well. His salvation is going to stay. It's going to remain forever. Interesting, he says that the heavens shall vanish away like a smoke. 
and the earth shall wax old like a garment. The word vanish means to pulverize. It also means to disappear. He uses the word smoke, which means a vapor or a dust. The heavens is going to disappear away like a vapor, like a dust, poof, and it's going to be gone. But then he says the earth is going to wax old like a garment. And the word wax old means to fail by implication to wear out, to decay, or even to consume. Like a garment, like a vesture, like a robe, like a raiment, like a rag that somebody wears. Because the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1 and 1. These were created by Christ and for the purpose of him. That's Colossians 1, 15 through 18, which lets me know when his purpose of the earth and his purpose of the heavens is fulfilled, there's no need for them again. Where are we going to stay? We're going to live in the new heaven and the new earth. Are we going to live in heaven? That's a great question. I know one thing, there won't be no sea, there won't be no sun, there won't be no cloud. There won't be anything that's going to separate the earth from the heaven, which means if I remove this ceiling, then whatever's upstairs. So if I have somebody upstairs from me, if I remove my ceiling, we're all in one location. So if you remove everything in between heaven and earth, it will still be one location. So sin took place in two places. It took place on earth. In the garden, in Genesis, the third chapter, it also took place in heaven. Ezekiel 28 and 15, Lucifer, the Bible said that there was iniquity that was found in his heart. So the first sin took place in heaven. That's why when Christ died, he had to die and he had to, his blood had to suffice, suffice for the things on the earth, below the earth and in the heaven. That's why he had to take the blood to his father to purify. And that's why he told Moses to make things according to the template or the pattern of things. What pattern of things? A pattern must exist. And that's the things that was in heaven already. So without a doubt, the Lord proclaimed that the heavens and the earth is going to be gone. They that dwell in the land are going to die just like those. Anybody that rejects his word, his plan, his salvation, his righteousness, his will, his law, his comment, or comments or commandments are going to die just like everything else. But his salvation, his deliverance, his aid or his victory is not going to die, nor will his righteousness be abolished. The word abolished means to be shattered, to be dismayed, to be broken. The earth will perish. The sun, the moon, the stars, the clouds, and everything else would go, but his salvation will always be. His righteousness will always be in existing. The last two verses. Hearken unto me. There that word hearken. This is the last time. Remember, he always wants them to hearken. And then he talks about who it is that he wants to hearken. He wants the one that knows righteousness. Remember, the one, the first one was those who sought after the Lord and, 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 and who sought after his righteousness. Here he says the ones that know righteousness, the people in whose heart, whose heart uh, is my law. Now he's talking to the specific people to give them a sign of hope. Fear you not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them up like wool. But my righteousness, there it is again, my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation shall uh, from generation to generation. That's an ongoing. That means it's going to continue to move from every generation his righteousness and his salvation is going to be extended to every end, to the uttermost end of the earth. So this is the third and the final time he says for them to hearken. This is the call for those who know the law of the Lord. These are the ones who not only know his law, but have his law in their heart. When you have the law of God in your heart, you practice his law. You submit you uh, uh, obtain his law. You're in obedience to his law and you hold his law close to your heart. That way, if you do anything wrong, you will become repentant because you know that his word says thou shalt not do. He says, hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. The word hearken here means to hear intelligently, often with implication of attention 
and obedience. He says, you that know, know, which means to see, to find out, to know by experience, to recognize, to consider, or even to be familiar with. Those of you who see, who see my righteousness, who have experienced, who can recognize, who consider, or who are even familiar with my righteousness. And remember, being familiar with it and knowing it is to know it uh, through experience. All right. He says, uh, th those of you, he commands those that know righteousness and whose righteousness or his law is in their heart, which means I'm guarding it. I'm protecting it. I understand it. I'm loving it and I'm obeying it. Even Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14 and 15 it says, for ye uh, uh, fear ye not the approach or the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. Is that revilings or revelings? Mm -hmm. The word fear means to revere or to cause to be frightened. Don't be fearful of their reproach. The word reproach means their shame, their rebuke, or even their scorn. They're going to come at you. They're going to be wondering, why are you holding on to this gospel, to this law? It ain't doing you no good. They're going to scandalize you. They're going to talk about your name. They're going to talk about your God. They're going to challenge you. But he says, don't be fearful of their reproach. Don't be fearful of their rebuke and of their scorn. Don't even be afraid. The word afraid means dismayed, broken, frightened, discouraged, or even beaten down of their revilings, which means an insult or scorn or taunt. Some say it's revilings. Some say revilings. I'm going to go with either one. It depends. Because the Bible speaks about when they did Jesus, they did that to him. But he didn't do that back in return. Yes. So the reproaches uh, will be coming from men uh, uh, that are on the earth and the earth is temporarily. So are their reproaches. And so are these men that will be doing these reproaches. So I say this to those of you all who are on the Lord's side and who are listening to the Lord, who are obedient to him. Those of you that might even be discouraged by what men are saying. Some of you all, you are the only ones in your family saved. You're the first ones in your family saved. You're the only ones on your job saved. I don't want to say you're the only one in your church saved. I'm going to save that till the after five conversation. That'll be the grown folks conversation. But you're the only one. Uh, and, and many people have scandalized you, a defamation of character. They have reproached you. They have rebuked you. They scorned you all and laughed at you and made mockery of you simply because you're holding on. You're patiently waiting for the Lord's deliverance to take place. I need you to understand God is a God that keeps his word. Check your past. See that you know and find out that he brought you from where you are. Oh my, check the start. Everybody didn't come from good start, yet you are the beginning of the great start of your offsprings. Yes, because that's how he does this. Psalms 118 and 6 says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Hebrews 13 and 6 says, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That's it. Make sure you like, like this channel. I need some thumbs up to change the algorithm. Thumbs up, hit that thumb up, smash that thumbs up and make sure that you hit like and subscribe to this channel and share this with somebody. Leave me some comments below. What do you think about this lesson? What angles would you have gone or what angles, what other information? Because remember, teachers, I'm going to say this, there was somebody who challenged me about not speaking in reference to slavery in last week's lesson. And I tried to tell the individual on my YouTube before I dismissed them and reported them that as a teacher, I don't have, I cannot stress every point. And so the individual thought that it was important. That is important to that individual because if we do too much referencing, we will change or it ceases. We won't be doing the lesson no more. 
we will be on something else. And so as teachers, we have to give what information either the Lord gives us to give or that we give in the amount of time. My lessons used to be an hour and 15 minutes. Check back two years ago and you will see. And I try to calm down some because I do in-depth study. This is half of what, uh, by the time I begin to record, this is half of what I would have done. As a matter of fact, the lesson that I did today and the notes, which is only 99 cent de- dom- um, uh, um, if, if you donation. In other words, you can't give nothing less than 99 cent. And part two of that, these notes, I got 10 pages of notes. That's not 99 cents per page. It's just 99 cent because I do in-depth study. And part two, somebody challenged me on that. And, and I was fine with the challenge. Until they said, trying to make a quick buck buck off the church. That's where I was a little indignant (laughs) on. Yes, yes. So the person who kept challenging me, which I don't have a problem with, but then they began to challenge everybody else. I then had to cover the people who are following me. I removed their comments for that sake. And yes, so you probably saw it. Yes. So we cannot deal with every point i might bring out some and i'm not afraid i'm not challenged i will put a point on the floor and let the holy ghost protect me but there are times when it's not necessary or you don't have to give as much information that's it lord have mercy i'm getting prepared lastly i'm getting ready to go to columbus ohio i am one of the instructors for the church of god in christ National AIM Department. My topic is a Sunday school lesson that died. Who killed it and how? What was the cause of death? We're going to be dealing with examining the lesson from every angle. This will be what's called a forensic class. I will be instructing Tuesday and Thursday. That's July the 5th and July the 7th. Yes, check me out. Those of you, I will be at the Hyatt Hotel in Columbus. Uh, Somebody need to come and buy me lunch, buy me breakfast or coffee or something. Uh, I'll take Starbucks. I prefer Dunkin's. <laughs> All right. I love you all. I love you with the Lord of Jesus. Listen, tell somebody that you love them. I'll let you know if I'm going to go live this coming Sunday. But if it's the Lord's will, I will try. I'm out. I'm out of time. Peace.